way of background, I just wanted to say the orientation that I'm going to be taking in sharing these uh, few moments with you. And that is that um, I work in a children's hospital, a specialty hospital, and specifically work with children who have had severe brain damage or disease. And um, in the process of um, treating them and getting them back to health as best as possible, um, we're seeing um, ways in which the education system can actually help them in the process of recovery. So this is the orientation that I'm coming from. And I wanted to um, acknowledge the sponsorship of Great Ormond Street Hospital, where I work, as well as University College London, which is the university that's the medical school of the hospital, and the Center for Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience and the Institute of Child Health, which caters to women and uh, mothers of children. Um, so we all are here with a united mission, uh, acknowledging really that um, uh, women have been subjected to a lot of oppression as a result of failure to acquire and access education. And, um, but we're not here to complain, but we're here to make a difference. And obviously, the best way of overcoming the oppression that has occurred throughout the ages is through acquisition of knowledge. We know that uh, two-thirds of uh, 77, 4 million adult illiterates in the world are actually women. And this next statistic that comes from the United Nations last year uh, indicates that there are 72 million children in the world of primary school age who are not attending school, and out of those, the majority are females. But we shouldn't be fooled by this figure of the majority, because 54% majority of females means that the rest of them are males, and they are not accessing education either. So this is actually a global problem. And this figure, by the way, has not changed over the past 20 years, so it is actually quite worrisome that despite all the efforts that are being expended, still children are being abused by not being uh, allowed to access education. We also know that women are significantly underrepresented in technology and science, which is the remit of this particular um, commission on status of women. And uh, the fact that there, there's only a uh, little over a quarter of all those who are pursuing scientific research basically indicates that women are not contributing to the technological advances that are taking place, even though they're fully capable of doing so, were it not for the fact that they cannot access education and opportunities in the same way as men. But I'm actually going to start from concentrating on um, how our brains acquire knowledge. Because it's really important to understand that we have different knowledge systems in the brain, and these different circuits in the brain accommodate these knowledge systems, and how our education system has developed to cater to some aspect of acquiring this knowledge, but not to others. So let's have a look here. There are two main categories, and I'm, I'm really simplifying this, but there are two main categories of knowledge. One set of knowledge is implicitly acquired, almost through a process of osmosis, so that we expect children to be exposed to this knowledge system, but nobody teaches them explicitly how to access it. And uh, it's understood that within the normal family environment and exposure to good adult role models, generally children pick up these implicit skills or implicit knowledge system. This is made up of rules that we learn to follow, habits that we acquire that are conducive to our good, healthy living, skills that we acquire, and how these are translated into actions that are implicitly learned but are executed every day in our everyday lives. There's another knowledge system which is called the explicit knowledge system, and this is made up of facts, the dictionary of knowledge about the world that we carry in our heads, and episodes. These are the events and episodes of our lives that make up our autobiography. So clearly, these two are facts and episodes that make up us as individuals, and this is really what's um, very much emphasized in the school curriculum. But these aspects are relatively neglected because nobody really bothers to teach them as such because you're expected to acquire them. So the current educational system emphasizes factual knowledge and acquisition of academic skills because these are explicit skills that are taught and you have to indicate your acquisition of it through examination, retelling of what you've learned, etc. But there's very little attention paid to nurturing of implicit knowledge, which is really the knowledge of the self. 
laying down foundations of social interaction, how to interact with other people. This is as children, of course. Learning appropriate conduct, because this you're supposed to learn this, but nobody teaches you. You're supposed to acquire it, or our brains are supposed to acquire it. Inspiring the love of learning. This is supposed to come from somewhere, but obviously not if you're not given the opportunity to experience what it's like to learn. And instilling the spirit of service to others, which is really the remit of what an educational system should be. So we do need an ethos to guide the education of the young. And when I mean the young, I mean both boys and girls. We're talking about the young generation that's going to be our future. And the purpose of the, the uh, ethos should really one that actually identifies the young developing child with the purpose of life. Why are they here on earth? What are they supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be doing something which is very grand, but for children, this is not readily obvious. It's to help advance human culture and society. And they have to go through stages where this gradually starts making sense to them. And the prerequisites for achieving this goal is the development of ethical, moral, and spiritual potentials. How do you translate this into an educational system? So, a little bit of art. So this is Michelangelo's moment of creation, God creating Adam. And as you can see, this is not in the real painting, of course, but little molecules, little DNA molecules have been put there to indicate that God passed on to man, the moment of creation, genes that allow man to acquire these qualities. These qualities which are implicit and they need to be nurtured to be shown but we do come into the world hardwired to develop these skills, to develop these potentialities. So human beings are endowed with a genetic predisposition to develop unique human attributes. And these are human attributes. Animals don't have them. So there's something in our genetic makeup that allows us to develop these, these attributes and qualities. And of course, we have gone through a huge process of evolution millions of years before we have gotten to where we have gotten, where we are able to ask the question, how do we actually operationalize this genetic endowment that we've been invested in? How did we, did we evolve into modern humans? Well, we know that our species is blessed with the ability to walk upright, which allows us to look into the horizon and ponder our future, ponder where we came from and where we're going. We are invested with big brains, Nobody has but as big a brain as we do in proportion to our bodies. This has enabled us to do tool making. It has also recently, like about half a million years ago, resulted in a change in our <coughs> genetic makeup, which enabled us to speak. No other species speaks. We are the only ones that speak and can allow others to share our experiences, our thought processes, our emotions, our feelings, our aspirations. No other species can do this. And we develop modern minds. Modern minds that allows us to travel in time so that you can go back to several generations ago and through your speech experience what it was like to be living 300 years ago, but also to travel forward into the future and imagine a world where the universe will become much more united than it is now. All of this is made possible because of the power of modern minds that has evolved over millions of years step by step. So we do have indeed bigger brains. This is a human brain in proportion to a chimpanzee's brain. And as you can see, it's huge. But it's not huge everywhere. There are some parts of the brain of the chimpanzee and the human brain that are actually quite similar. What is exploded is this area, which we call the frontal lobes. This is where speech and language is based. Deep down here is where the memory structures are based. So it's not the sheer size, but it is a combination of size and location and the fact that it has actually been endowed with these qualities, genetically speaking, that differentiates it from other species. So um, over the past 20 years or so, uh, with the explosion of brain imaging techniques, it has become possible to look inside the brain and ask questions about not only how our bodies function, our brains function in controlling our bodies, 
but how our brains function in terms of higher aspects of cognitive function like decision making, the feelings of consciousness, for example. These are questions that now modern neuroscience is asking. And there are many ways of tackling this problem because when you try to understand an abstract con concept such as consciousness, you don't want to imply that consciousness resides in a particular area of the brain because clearly it doesn't. It's like an orchestra, it's everywhere and it's nowhere to be found. So you can look at the brain, you can see, you can measure all aspects of it, but you're never going to be able to find a seat for consciousness. What we know is that it's peculiar to human beings to have this type of consciousness, but it's associated with the brain, but it's not inside the brain. And so are the concepts of social and moral conduct. They are associated with brain function, but they don't reside in the brain. And a good example of this was happened in the form of a mini revolution in the year 1848, where a very nice and friendly and considerate foreman by the name of Phineas Gage was working on the railroad uh, line, and quite by accident, a massive iron rod accidentally struck his head. And the missile entered the head of Phineas Gage just beneath his left eye, tearing through his skull and departing from a hole on top of his head. So you would have thought that he should have died really as a result of this accident, but miraculously he didn't. He survived. It was not the end of him, and at least not of the body that bore his name. But what happened to this friendly and considerate and kind and social and moral human being after this accident? This is a picture of the rod that actually entered the head of Phineas Gage. As you can see, it entered on the left side, it's exited on the right side, it's obliterated much of his frontal lobes, the important part that I was referring to earlier on. And this is a description of how this man's personality changed as a result of this injury. After a few minutes, and this is an account of his attending physician, John Harlow, he writes, after a few minutes of unconsciousness, Phineas was able to speak and sit up. And after three weeks convalescing, he had almost entirely recovered from his injuries. Well, that's miraculous enough in itself. But something else also happened. Although he was physically healthy, he was not the same man anymore. Whereas the old Phineas Gage had been friendly and considerate, the new man had an evil temper and the strength of an ox. The equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculties and animal propensities seemed to have been destroyed in this regard. In this regard, his mind was radically changed, so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said that he was no longer engaged. Now, it doesn't take an accident to do this. Many other factors in life can do this. Severe malnutrition can damage the brain. Um, severe stress can damage the brain. Severe deprivation and injustice can damage the brain and can have manifestations not too different from the ones that I have just described, which have actually resulted from physical injury. But the case of Phineas Gage enabled the open the way to look at the consequences of what deprivation and damage can do to moral and ethical behavior. So the brain is really a vehicle for expression of human virtues. And we can interfere with this process if the mind is interfered with for one reason or another. And deprivation and inequality and injustice are ways in which you can deprive the healthy mind of its function. So human virtues, for example, empathy, compassion, justice, equality, are all emergent properties of a complex brain. But they need to be nurtured. They won't happen automatically. They won't come into being just like that because we've been endowed with the capacity. But these qualities do have to be developed from the outset of childhood and will not otherwise emerge despite the biological predisposition that we have. Because time is running short, I won't go into this, but to just tell you that um, there are various models of how social and moral development emerge during childhood. And we go through, all children go through very egocentric stages where the perspective is all to do with themselves because they can't really um, dissociate themselves from the rest of the world. So this is the earliest stage of moral development, which is 
what they have to do in order to avoid punishment. That's the best they can do, and this is really very young children. By the time they become about nine years of age, they have very clear understanding that in order to serve your own needs, you must recognize the right of others because they have been trained, and this has become actually explicit for them. Then you go through the conventional stage where children learn to rely on the golden rule, which is be a good person, and in return you will be treated as one. And they reach a higher stage of recognition that there is obligation <coughs> to society and individual is, within, is viewed as being an entity within that system. And this happens to be the characteristic of most, most adults and adolescents. So by the age of 11, 12, 13, the child is able to actually take on this complex view of the world in relation to themselves. The next stage, which is post-conventional, is the recognition that moral perspectives may conflict with the law, and therefore you have to consider the rights and welfare of everyone. And the final stage is a personal commitment to universal moral principles. And this is actually achieved by very few adults. Very few adults actually get to this highest stage of moral and social development. And of course, if Phineas Gage was one in who would have been at this stage, but I guess his injury had completely obliterated that. So these are the stages of moral development that we have to try and nurture through our education system. And of course, the role of the teachers is essential, recognizing that there are unique endowments for each child, inspiring the love of learning. This really comes from teaching and nurturing that you get in school, but also in the home and provide mentorship and role models that children can actually emulate as they grow up. Um, so another important point is systematic learning and implementation. So both children and teachers, student and teachers, are together in this um, process of learning. They are exchanging roles in a sense, because as students learn, they can pass it on to others. They are engaging in the process of cons consultation and formulation of goals that benefit not just the individual. As Aaron said, you know, we're taught that we have to do, learn something. We have to learn science and technology so that we can gain a gainful living. But it's not just for ourselves that we're doing this. We're doing this so that we can contribute to society and translate our new knowledge into actions that will benefit others as well as of our, ourselves. And finally, the, really the thing that we're after is to transform not only the individual through education and training, but society. This means that we have to formulate personal goals that develop the individual as well as society through new scientific and technological discoveries that actually improve the well-being of the society and the community that we live in. We foster the adoption of a world vision and the concept of global citizenship, but we can't just talk about it. We have to be able to develop a curriculum that is consistent with global prosperity. Otherwise, global citizenship doesn't mean anything. And we have to view humanity as a bird that requires both wings to fly high. We don't want to emphasize the plight of women too much, because really, we don't want to reverse the balance. Rather, we want to establish a balance. And that means doing it in a way that both males and females will benefit. And through this, we will then be releasing the human potential through education. So this is what we see, but this is what's hidden and needs to come out to be expressed. Thank you.